Track 2. Listening Part 1. Worksheet 2. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two friends talking about travelling on public transport. Now look at questions 1 and 2. I find commuter behaviour on public transport fascinating, especially at rush hour. Yeah, it's weird how uneasy it makes people being forced into such intimacy with strangers, all helplessly crowded in together. I guess that's why they read or listen to music and engage with fellow travellers so reluctantly, just to give up a seat for someone elderly or disabled and so on. People approach each other so apologetically. Mind you, half the time nobody registers that there's someone speaking to them because they're all wearing earplugs or headphones. And people put a bag on the seat next to them just to lower the chance of someone sitting there. Yeah, apparently chatting and positive body language are actually more successful ways of getting to feel at ease than defensive strategies. I heard a radio programme about it. It seems the seat layout can be a problem. It's awkward to talk to anyone if you're right next to them. But if you're facing each other, you can pick up key non-verbal signals, which makes you feel less vulnerable. You'd think on regular commutes, where you often see the same faces in the same seats, it wouldn't be such a problem and people would be more at ease. But I'm not sure that's the case. Now listen again. I find commuter behaviour on public transport fascinating, especially at rush hour. Yeah, it's weird how uneasy it makes people being forced into such intimacy with strangers, all helplessly crowded in together. I guess that's why they read or listen to music and engage with fellow travellers so reluctantly, just to give up a seat for someone elderly or disabled and so on. People approach each other so apologetically. Mind you, half the time nobody registers that there's someone speaking to them because they're all wearing earplugs or headphones. And people put a bag on the seat next to them just to lower the chance of someone sitting there. Yeah, apparently chatting and positive body language are actually more successful ways of getting to feel at ease than defensive strategies. I heard a radio programme about it. It seems the seat layout can be a problem. It's awkward to talk to anyone if you're right next to them. But if you're facing each other, you can pick up key non-verbal signals, which makes you feel less vulnerable. You'd think on regular commutes, where you often see the same faces in the same seats, it wouldn't be such a problem and people would be more at ease. But I'm not sure that's the case. Extract 2. You hear two friends discussing the use of social media. Now look at questions 3 and 4. I do sometimes wonder about the value of posting things on social media. What do you mean? So many people just give vent to anger or frustration. At any given moment, with all the different online platforms, there are thousands of people who often don't know anything about the subject in question, telling others their ideas are rubbish. They should at least check their facts. I do. Anyway, I find it amazing when people react aggressively in public forums. I regularly post comments on various blogs and pride myself on not overreacting when someone has a go at something I've said, but it's hard not to. I do get angry too, but I really don't I think... I guess there's something to be said for some sort of self-censoring rather than posting too wildly. The thing I find frustrating about social media is that it encourages an insatiable supply of short bits of infotainment. You know, sharing news bites that are witty or shocking, and people tend not to think critically about what they read. But most of it's not even interesting, let alone true. I'm not including the kind of self-promotion a lot of people go in for in social media. Photos of their wonderful holidays or kids' graduation. That's all about wanting to look good to other people and mostly harmless. Now listen again. I do sometimes wonder about the value of posting things on social media. What do you mean? 
So many people just give vent to anger or frustration. At any given moment, with all the different online platforms, there are thousands of people who often don't know anything about the subject in question, telling others their ideas are rubbish. They should at least check their facts. I do. Anyway, I find it amazing when people react aggressively in public forums. I regularly post comments on various blogs and pride myself on not overreacting when someone has a go at something I've said, but it's hard not to. I do get angry too, but I really don't I think... I guess there's something to be said for some sort of self-censoring rather than posting too wildly. The thing I find frustrating about social media is that it encourages an insatiable supply of short bits of infotainment. You know, sharing news bites that are witty or shocking, and people tend not to think critically about what they read. But most of it's not even interesting, let alone true. I'm not including the kind of self-promotion a lot of people go in for in social media. Photos of their wonderful holidays or kids' graduation. That's all about wanting to look good to other people and mostly harmless. Extract 3. You hear part of a radio programme in which two journalists are discussing surveys. Now look at questions 5 and 6. There's so much we still have to learn about what influences human behaviour. We don't really know how to affect positive changes in what people do. Personally, I don't think our focus on large-scale surveys as the main source of insight into how people behave helps us. We hear all these sweeping statements about attitudes towards everything from brands to climate change, but the majority of research is built on self-reporting methodologies, like surveys, in which participants describe their own attitudes themselves. That's too narrow, because people's answers often depend on their mood, or what's going on around them, or how they think they should answer, and that could certainly have implications when it comes to interpreting the results, especially if... You mean they don't tell what causes people to change their behaviour? That's right! There are actually some very interesting examples of companies adopting more unconventional strategies to finding ways to change behaviour. One soft drinks manufacturer recently launched a project with the aim of improving recycling behaviour. Rather than use the customary strategy of a huge consumer survey, the daily lifestyles of small samples of people were observed closely. Then they were invited to get involved in problem-solving processes. Of course, it may turn out to be ineffective, but I'd like to learn more about the research findings. It's all still ongoing. Now listen again. There's so much we still have to learn about what influences human behaviour. We don't really know how to affect positive changes in what people do. Personally, I don't think our focus on large-scale surveys as the main source of insight into how people behave helps us. We hear all these sweeping statements about attitudes towards everything from brands to climate change, but the majority of research is built on self-reporting methodologies, like surveys, in which participants describe their own attitudes themselves. That's too narrow, because people's answers often depend on their mood, or what's going on around them, or how they think they should answer, and that could certainly have implications when it comes to interpreting the results, especially if... You mean they don't tell what causes people to change their behaviour? That's right. There are actually some very interesting examples of companies adopting more unconventional strategies to finding ways to change behaviour. One soft drinks manufacturer recently launched a project with the aim of improving recycling behaviour. Rather than use the customary strategy of a huge consumer survey, the daily lifestyles of small samples of people were observed closely. Then they were invited to get involved in problem-solving processes – of course, it may turn out to be ineffective, but I'd like to learn more about the research findings. It's all still ongoing.